In this video, I want to talk about three software design principles that I'm using to maximize the agility and flexibility of my startup. By the way, if you're new here, I'm Addy and this is episode 9 of a series where I'm challenging myself to build a tech startup from scratch over 90 days and document everything on this channel. And in my previous video, I shared that I'm building a tool that lets users edit their videos much faster by automating all the tedious video editing tasks with just a single click of a button. But building software like this comes with unique challenges. After launch, I might discover that users love a certain feature in my application, which would signal that I should build more of those types of features. Or perhaps new market trends emerge and I need to quickly adapt to those. That's why in this video, I want to share the three design principles that I'm using to keep my code base agile and flexible, allowing me to quickly adapt to different scenarios. Okay, so the first design principle I'm using is called the layered architecture. And as the name suggests, this means splitting my backend code into multiple layers, where each layer is responsible for doing one specific thing and one specific thing only. But what makes this really powerful is that I'm following what's called a single direction dependency rule, which means that each layer should only know about the layer that's directly below it and nothing else. So let me break that down with a real example from my video processing application. When a user tries to upload a video file, the front end code will need to generate a unique S3 upload URL by sending an HTTP request called generate upload URL to my backend. That request will be received by a layer at the top called the API layer. And its only job is to handle the incoming HTTP requests using Flask. And it does that by extracting basic stuff like the request body and the user's authentication token from the request. And once that's done, it delegates the responsibility of generating the upload URL to the service layer. That's it. No business logic, no database queries, just request handling. Below the API layer, we have the service layer. This is where all the business logic lives. For video uploads, it handles things like generating the signed S3 URL and enforcing rules about what types of videos can be uploaded. Think of it as the brain of the application. But to successfully carry out this business logic, the service layer needs to read and write some metadata to a Postgres database, which is why its only dependency is the repository layer. So naturally, below the service layer comes the repository layer. And its job is to house all of the SQL queries needed for different parts of the application. So a user repository would handle user related queries, while a file repository would manage file metadata queries. But notice that this layer doesn't actually talk to the database directly. That's what the data layer is for, which is also the only dependency of the repository layer. Finally, at the bottom, we have the data layer. Now, this is just a simple abstraction around database communications. It could be using SQL Alchemy or any other database client. And the layers above don't need to know or care about what its implementation details are. So hopefully you can see that a layered structure like this gives us a clean separation between the different parts of my application. And later in this video, I'll show you why this kind of organization is super valuable for a startup and how it allows my code base to be more flexible and agile when I need to make changes or pivot based on user feedback. Okay. Now that I've showed you the layered architecture, the next question is how do we actually create these layers? If you look at our diagram, you'll notice that each layer depends on the layer below it. We can't have an API layer without a service layer, and we can't have a service layer without a repository layer, and so on. So this means that we need to build our application from the bottom up. And this is where our second design principle comes in, which is called dependency injection. Instead of each layer creating its own dependencies, we'll pass them from the outside. To start off, I've got this create app function, which is called the composition root, which is basically a single place where all of our layers get created and wired together. Within this function, we start off by creating the bottom most layer, our data layer. And since it has no dependencies, it becomes the foundational layer of our application. Next, we can create the repositories that our app requires to function properly, while passing in the data layer as the only dependency. 
and the implementation of create repositories could look something like this. Then we create our service layers while passing in the repositories as their only dependency. Finally, we'll create our API layer by passing it the service layers as dependencies. And because the API layer uses Flask, its implementation might look something like this. And that's it. So even though our API layer sits at the top of our layered architecture, it's actually the last thing that we create. Now this approach might seem a bit more complex than just creating everything where you need it, but as I'll show you later on in the video, it gives us incredible flexibility. It makes the code base much easier to test, modify and adapt as the startup needs change over time. The final design principle I want to talk about is something called schema driven API development. Now this might sound complex, but it's actually solving a really common problem in web applications, which is making sure that your front end and back end are speaking the same language and are kept in sync. Let me explain what I mean. When a front end sends data to a back end or vice versa, the data needs to follow a specific structure. For example, in my video processing app, when a user tries to upload a video, we need to make sure that it's the right file type, has the right file metadata and so on. To validate this data on the front end, we could use a library like Zod and define a schema that looks like this. Then, before sending a request to the backend, the frontend can validate against this schema. The backend, on the other hand, would also need to define the same schema using a library like Pydantic, which would look like this. And when it receives the request from the frontend, it would validate the request against this Pydantic data model. But there's a big problem here. We're defining the same schema twice on both the front end and the back end, which means that if we want to support a new file type, we need to remember to update the schema in both places. And doing this manually is really error prone and can lead to a lot of inconsistencies. And this is where schema driven development comes in. So instead of defining our schema in multiple places, we define them in a single source of truth, a schema file. Then we use a tool like data model code generator to automatically generate both our TypeScript and Python types by running a command like this. And this would generate the same TypeScript and Python schemas that I showed you earlier. Schema driven development might seem like a bit of an extra step at first, but it's already saved me hours of debugging and prevented several potential bugs. When I need to change my API structure, I just update the schema file, regenerate the types and both my front end and back end stay perfectly in sync. And for a startup where we need to move fast but stay reliable, this kind of automation is really valuable. Now that I've shown you the three design principles I'm using, Let's talk about why I've gone through the trouble of setting these up for my startup. I've been reading this book called The Lean Startup by Eric Ries. And one of the key ideas he emphasizes is that startups need to move quickly. And to move quickly, they need to be able to experiment and pivot based on user feedback. So let me run you through some exercises and show you how these different principles might make that possible. Let's say my video processing app takes off and suddenly we're handling a hundred times more users than before. And because of this increased traffic, I start seeing database connection errors because we're hitting Postgres connection limits. So with my layered architecture, I can change my data layers implementation from this to this. What I've essentially done is use a technique called connection pooling, which now allows my application to handle more concurrent requests. Instead of creating and closing database connections for every request, I can now maintain a pool of 20 connections that can be reused with the ability to create 10 more during traffic spikes. And because of the layered architecture, this change remains isolated to the data layer, meaning that no other parts of my application need to be updated at all. So after making that change, let's say that everything is running smoothly for a few months until I discover through user feedback that 80% of users who are using my background blur effect keep requesting for the ability to control how strong the blur is. 
Some want a subtle blur for presentations and others want maximum blur for privacy reasons. And maybe right now my backend only supports a fixed blur strength. But thanks to dependency injection, I can easily swap out my processing service to support this. To do that, I change the implementation from this to this. And then when I create my video service in the service layer, I simply swap out the video processor that it uses. And that's it. My backend can now handle different blur strengths and we didn't need to touch any of the other layers. After this, the last thing we need to do is roll out these changes to the front end by updating our API to support this new parameter. And because we used a schema driven approach, this becomes a super straightforward change to make. All we need to do is update the schema.yaml file and from there, regenerate the Zod and Pydantic schemas for both the front-end and back-end. And that's basically the power of schema-driven development. We made one change to the schema file and both the front-end and back-end automatically enforce this new blur strength parameter. The front-end gets autocomplete suggestions and TypeScript validation for the new parameter and our back-end automatically validates incoming requests. We didn't have to manually update validation in multiple places or worry about keeping the front end and back end in sync. The lessons I've shared in this video are something I really wish someone had taught me early on in my career. Everyone can write code and with enough effort and brute force, most of us can build something that works. But the real challenge comes when you need to expand that code and adapt to user feedback. That's why I wanted to share these design principles with you. They're practical tools that can help you build software that grows with your business. And if this feels overwhelming, don't worry. My goal wasn't to make you master these concepts in one video, but to show you that this world of software design principles exists. If you found this video useful, then consider hitting that like button to boost it on YouTube and leave a comment so I can get to know you better. Thanks for watching.